Thank you ever so much. And of course, thank you to the organizers for the invitation. Thank you, Mike Haru, for that very kind introduction. And it is a privilege for me to be here. Uh, this is my first time at PASC, and uh, uh, what, a, what an honor to be here as a keynote speaker to open the conference as my first visit. And um, let's see, I want to start a conversation. I um, hope that uh, this, uh, that you'll uh, enjoy some of the thought-provoking um, uh, remarks I have prepared for you. I wrote this conference, I wrote this, this talk specifically for today. So uh, it's, it's the first, it's the first uh, try at it. Let's go. Anti-patterns for scientific machine learning. Um, Mike already introduced me, but I wanted to highlight a couple of things that have to do you know, uh, with the credentials I, I bring to this conversation. Um, Mike mentioned I was reproducibility chair of Supercomputing Conference in 2019. Uh, that was a very uh, 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 strenuous work to change the culture of a whole community in terms of um, uh, open sharing of digital artifacts, uh, but the community received that very well. And there are two National Academies committees in which I have served. One is for reproducibility and replicability in science, and the other one is for the open source software policies for NASA. That was uh, released a report in 2018, and it has had quite a bit of impact as well, though you, you may not have learned of it, but um, as I'll tell you more later, NASA has initiated the uh, Transform to Open Science mission, in part inspired by the recommendations in this report. And um, NumFocus was also mentioned by Mike. NumFocus is the nonprofit um, uh, umbrella of many of the uh, scientific Python software packages that you may be using, uh, like um, um, SciPy, SimPy, Jupyter, NumPy, Pandas, Scikit-Learn. All of those packages that make your life easier have started as a volunteer effort, but over time had required some institutional support, and uh, NumFocus provides that in terms of their ability to receive funds uh, as a, as a, uh, with, you know, without having to pay individual taxes to the IRS, and having uh, legal and copyright and administrative support and so on. So it's a very important service that you may not have heard about. And all of this, for me, in terms of reproducibility and open science starts when I uh, gave a little talk, actually, it was a lightning talk, it was 2012, it's been uh, just over 10 years now, when I did the so-called reproducibility PI manifesto, which was a set of pledges about how I was going to lead my group and teach my graduate students. And uh, this is all uh, starts then. Now, for this talk, uh, I was inspired by this event. Last year, I, I had the pleasure to participate in a workshop at the Santa Fe Institute uh, in New Mexico that was focused on scientific machine learning for complex systems. And uh, you see the organizers there who kindly invited me to a, with a group of about 30 experts that were from an in, uh, industry, academia, and national laboratories. And we came together for three days of discussions and, of course, presentations, but plenty of discussions. Uh, mathematicians, statisticians, computational scientists, computer scientists and also application uh, domain scientists uh, to try to come together in, across disciplines. Now, as the presentations and discussion sessions went on, a nagging concern started emerging about the need for better practices and reporting standards for building trust in scientific applications of machine learning. And that is inspiration for today's talk. At the end of the workshop, I proposed to the group to do an unconference style activity where all of the participants received post-it notes and we wrote in post-it notes the things that we thought were needing for more trust in the progress of science via machine learning approaches. So we all started writing things in post-it notes and then we, there was a big window there looking out to the patio where we stuck the post-it notes and then we started moving them around creating clusters. And we saw clearly how clusters were appearing with the concerns of all the participants. And from that, and we took some pictures and took some notes, a subgroup of uh, the participants, we have started working on um, drafting a perspective piece that we want to title Good Practices in Scientific Machine Learning. We use good practices because when you say best practices, it's kind of like too much 
too much, you know, too much weight on your shoulders. Just good practices. Um, so we hope that this will start a fruitful conversation across disciplines. This talk is inspired by the conversations at the workshop and also my own personal frustrations in reading the literature, uh, the avalanche of literature and the new machine learning applications and, and methods in computational science, which of course have appeared the last few years in all of our conferences um, in uh, scientific computing and high performance computing. So I've titled it Anti-Patterns of Scientific Machine Learning to Fool the Masses. This is credit to um, of course, David Bailey, who gave a very uh, famous talk uh, 20 years ago, maybe, that was called The 12 Ways to Fool the Masses, uh, and it was directly uh, targeting HPC and performance-related claims. So I, I, I draw inspiration from him. I've used this before in terms of reproducibility, but now I'm focusing on scientific machine learning. And what, why do I, do I call it anti-patterns? So in case you haven't heard that, term, anti-patterns is something that is a frequently occurring pattern that is ineffective and really risks being counterproductive. The term comes from software engineering where there's a classic book called Design Patterns, which um, every student of computer science uh, is exposed to in the later editions. It highlights desirable and effective patterns for code. So an anti-pattern is something that is recurring. People talk about the rule of three in computer science. So if it appears you know, three times already, then you're seeing a pattern, OK? Uh, it has bad consequences, and a better solution exists, OK? So um, if you witness something that is you know, ineffective, and you witness it occurring at least three times, you are beholding an anti-pattern. Now, the point is that documenting anti-patterns is an effective way of revealing how to make improvements. And so I want to call attention today to anti-patterns in scientific machine learning with a call to do better. And the first anti-pattern that I want to focus on is performance claims out of context. And when in machine learning also we find these questionable baselines, um, like a naive method that domain experts would never use uh, to compare against with your new fancy uh, machine learning approach. A uh, few, the, those are real photographs of the unconference post-it notes, so it appeared uh, many times as a concern for different people there. So a quote to start with. Here's a quote. Uh, this data-driven hot method uh, gives accurate solutions with a dramatic drop in the required resolution. Resolutions four times or eight times coarser than is possible with standard methods. Okay, um, coarser resolutions, well, if you're looking at coarser resolutions, it means you're saving time computing, right? That's the concern, if you can do it with less points. And so the question is, at what cost are you getting that model that allows you to do coarser resolutions? Because if I had to invest four times as much effort to get a method that gives me four times coarser resolution, I didn't move. I'm in the same spot as I started. Then, what are those standard methods that you speak of? And so for me, it's dissatisfying to read something like this, to read that this new method allows for X coarser resolutions, omitting any mention of the cost right there uh, in the abstract <laughs> immediately um, that was required to generate this, this new model. And here's another quote. The learned model is clearly far superior to polynomial approximation, demonstrating that the spatial resolution required can be greatly reduced. So I have questions. Far superior to a method, polynomial approximation, that when I look at the context of this paper, um, you will notice I'm somewhat anonymizing the quotes, just to preserve uh, the dignity of, the, of their authors, um, and, um, and just to be kind. 
Um, but in this case, the, so I'm not giving you all the details of the settings, but the settings of the problem um, where they're studying this new learned model, uh, you know, polynomial approximation is really a poor method to solve that problem. It's just a bad baseline. Better methods were shown in the paper, mind you, in the results, but all the claims are really comparing with the worst method as baseline. So that is dis disappointing to me. And indeed, to several others, we've had a discussion about this uh, on Twitter with some colleagues. Uh, this was um, back when it was still pleasant to use Twitter, as you can see from the dates there, 2021. And my esteemed colleague at, um, in London, Timo Betke, pointed out, it seems that machine learning in this case was compared as an approximation tool to a bad way of doing an approximation, namely polynomial interpolation in what looks like equidistant points. And indeed, the problem at hand was a problem that uh, we know that if we use a low-order method, it's known to exhibit so-called Gibbs phenomenon, and of course, uh, for that class of problems, a, a polynomial approximation with equidistant points is a bad approach. So, next one, um, as I concluded here um, as a CFD expert, I'm just disappointed when a paper claims that their method is far superior to others, that it can greatly reduce grid resolutions, without giving readers all the numbers to go along with those claims. It really is just polite <laughs> to, give you, to give readers all the material necessary to make their own assessments about your claims. And this is what uh, the good behavior in science should be. Okay, so here's another quote. The overall agreement between a neural network-based method, so again, scratching a little bit, censoring there, um, and a commercial sol solver in this case, they used a commercial sol solver to compare, it's very good, okay? It's very good. It compares very well. They agree. Now, if you look at the results, you find that this assessment is made with a line plot for a quantity of interest, you know, some quantity of interest, and what we used to call when I was a student the eyeball metric, right? You just look at it and you say, they agree. It looks like they agree. You'd be surprised how forgiving your eyes are. Um, in fact, you can have even 1%, 2% error in some application that is unacceptable, and you eye, your eye will see those two lines coinciding. Okay, so um, plot with just lines on it is helpful to make your point, but please give the numbers, please give some numeric um, assessment of that agreement, and more than that, there's no mention of runtimes at all. So there's some agreement, but how does your method really compare in terms of the time it took to implement it, the time it took to run it? And mind you, did you run in a very expensive GPU in the cloud while the uh, other method ran on your laptop? We see many times that that is the case. And so you should mention that. This is an anti-pattern. Uh, again, if I'm showing you this, it's because at least three times we can find examples. And here's another one. Um, a novel and fast approach, parenthesis 1000x, to learning the solution operator of a PDE. This is from the paper's abstract, directly. So what does 1000x mean? If it's in the abstract, I always tell my students, the abstract should contain the main, uh, the key idea of each section of your paper. You need to put your result and your main finding in the abstract, and it be, should be complete. Understanding that most people will only read the title and abstract of your work, uh, and you want you know, to attract a few to read the whole paper, but the reality is that 90% of people just read the title and abstract. The results should be there. And so I ask myself, is the comparison point a competitive implementation? within its own class of methods? We don't know. So this just leaves us guessing, and it's disappointing. So here's an example where the authors of a new method to solve PDEs claim that their method is much faster than a traditional numerical method by a lot. And so they offer this, quote, new approach 
effective at performing accurate long-time simulations for a wide range of parametric ODE and PDE systems. That's the quote. So we have a plot of the runtime for solving a problem with their method compared with a traditional numerical solver. Nice job giving me a log scale. So I can see that, you know, that difference is quite um, hefty. There's a hefty speed up. But what is the numerical solver being compared against? It just says numerical solver there, right? So I have to dig a little deeper in the paper. Um, and it doesn't really give you a lot of information. You have to dig hard to try to find out. So because the information is not sufficient there, some other people have been looking at that and say, well, if I want to solve that same problem that is being showcased in the paper with an optimized method, in fact, if you use a library from the Julia language, that is an optimized numerical method to solve this class of problems, that is their benchmark, you could get the results 7,000 times faster than this so-called faster neural network method, which ran on an expensive GPU, <laughs> while the Julia uh, benchmark runs on a laptop. And this, this was confirmed by Chris Rakaukas at MIT and from the Julia uh, programming language um, uh, with some humor. <laughs> it's a similar story with other publications, I have to say. So this is one example that I've picked up here. Um, some paper on Fourier neural operators that shows results compared with a very slow implicit Euler method. There's another paper so the, of the so-called deep XDE code that uses the Lorentz equation. But results with a diff eq flux.gl from the Julia program as four orders of magnitude faster. So, Ignoring the fact that we actually do have fast libraries that have been optimized to solve these numerical uh, ODE, this, this ODE problems and PDE problems is just a bad habit, it's a bad pattern. The pattern here is not just comparing with uh, uh, a, a, you know, a poor method. It is the, the, the issue is I understand the dilemma the authors are facing, because it's actually hard to optimize classical numerical codes. This is why we have this avalanche of papers using all of these machine learning methods to solve you know, all kinds of problems, because you grab PyTorch or you grab another library, and you can write a PDE solver in 200 lines. So that's quite nice. So that, you know, it means that your uh, second year PhD student can actually do it. But writing an optimized numerical solver is actually quite hard. So, you know, yes, you could say that's one advantage of these, these new machine learning methods, but we have to be transparent and, and honest in the community with what it is that we're offering. Um, um, and Chris Rakaukas of Julia um, is of the opinion, really, that this is a software problem. So I recognize that, in fact, researchers don't have the equivalent of a PyTorch, for, but for classical numerical methods. But let's recognize that as a, maybe a lack of um, good quality uh, libraries for um, uh, the well-known numerical methods that are known to work in these problems um, and not try to you know, forget that they exist. So enough with that one. Here's another anti-pattern, uh, which is incomplete reporting. And some of these patterns kind of like intersect, they appear together. And um, in this case, what I want to focus on is failing to report the full computational cost or the cost of data generation to train the machine learning models. And this situation really bothered a lot of the Santa Fe participants, and so you can see it appeared in a lot of our post-it notes. And here's a quote. We first generate a training set of high-resolution data and then learn... Wait, wait. How is the data generated? And at what cost? What is the cost of training uh, that machine learning method? And this is not reported in the paper, but if you dig deep, you will find some things in the supplementary materials. And you find some clues. Um, in the supplementary materials, I could find that, and this was also commented on Twitter with some of my colleagues, that to get the training data, the authors generated 8,000 highly resolved solutions um, sampled from 800 simulations with a fifth order finite difference method. Um, I'm not really thrilled by this. You run 800 simulations with a standard numerical scheme to get training data that train a neural network that gives you a scale quotes, better model, and training hogs a GPU for one hour, 
Then you use this model to solve Burger's equation in 1D. Um, Burger's equation, by the way, is step number four, the 12 steps to Navier-Stokes, which is a beginning learning module in CFD that I wrote several years ago. Where is, well, this problem is solved in under 10 lines of Python in milliseconds of runtime. Not impressed. Um, quote from another paper. The data for the Navier-Stokes equations is obtained by the direct numerical simulation zero discussion of anything about the DNS solver that was used to generate the training data. No mention of the computational cost to generate this data. You can find such examples over and over again. There's no point in dwelling so much more in it, on it. The point is, is, is rather clear, I think. Researchers should report all of the steps to arrive at their finding, and they should also report all the computational resources that they used in each step in terms of hardware and runtime and also developer time. Let's move on to another Andy pattern, which is renaming all things. Many times this is unintentional. It's an unintentional consequence of the disciplinary silos. Of course, statisticians have been complaining for a long time that machine learning folks are often rehashing their methods and slapping a new term on it, right? If you're a statistic statistician in the room, wave, because you <laughs> I've heard this many times. But sometimes it's a little bit worse. Um, what we've seen several times without being amused is a paper where a neural network is used somewhere in the workflow to approximate a function, and suddenly an otherwise old method gets called deep. So here's an example that hit close to home, uh, because it picks up on a numerical method that I worked on in my PhD. In fact, your uh, other keynote speaker, Petros Komutsakos, if he's in the room, uh, he would not be amused either. He also worked in uh, random, uh, in, vo in vortex methods uh, uh, in his PhD. We had the same advisor, and there's another person in the conference, Jens Walter, who also worked in, in vortex methods uh, years ago. So it's a unique concentration uh, of experts in this topic here. So this is a deep round of vortex method. I did less of an effort to anonymize this one. Um, <laughs> <laughs> because it hit close to home. A novel physics-informed machine learning framework. <sighs> okay, so it's the classic random vortex method which was invited, invented by Turing in 1973. A vorticity equation that represents the Navier-Stokes equation with a random walk that simulates diffusion. This is very old. We're talking about a 50-year-old method. And it uses a neural network to represent the velocity, the equation for the velocity that is obtained for the vorticity via an integral equation. Now, the state of the art to solve this problem, this goes back to when I was a PhD student, is to compute the velocity with a fast multiple method at order n. An order n optimized method, well, this state of the art is not mentioned in the paper at all. They literally just replaced the velocity equation, which is an integral equation, as I said, that can be discretized by Gaussian quadrature that turns into an order, uh, to a, like a n-body problem, and that's why the fast multiple method comes in. They replaced that with a feed-forward neural network and called the process neural random vortex dynamics. To make, to make matters worse, they compared the results with a vanilla pin physics-informed neural network implementation, but never mentioned how it might compare with the classic vortex method with state-of-the-art techniques, much less to a standard Navier-Stokes solver. After all, their examples are all classic two-dimensional simple ben benchmarks. <laughs> Another anti-pattern that should worry us, and of course, this is not exclusive of scientific ma machine learning, as several of my other examples uh, you could say as well, but it appears in traditional scientific computers papers too, yes, yes, let's admit that, glossing over or ignoring the limitations of the proposed new methods, or the study itself. And the issue with this is it leads to this ballooning over claims in the citation chain, because then you have other papers that say such and such solved this equation, solved this problem with a neural network or a, a approach, when in fact they did not, or they did so under very limited conditions. And then the citations of, as I always tell my, tell my students, always go back to the source, <laughs> citing somebody because, citing a paper because somebody else cited and believing what uh, that second reference is, is a bad idea. So this, this just 
leads to an exponential overclaim um, uh, race. Okay, here's a typical example. The paper says, we used our hot method to directly simulate incompressible flows, including two-dimensional cylinder wake. Okay, but there are some issues. Um, if you look at the paper carefully, you have to go beyond the abstract, they provided DNS data as boundary conditions for the training. So it's a data-driven scenario. In fact, the circular cylinder was not even in the domain of computation. There's no discussion of this limitation in the paper at all. And indeed, we have been experimented with these kinds of methods, um, physics and neural networks, for some time. And we found them to be unable to capture vortex shedding behind a circular cylinder in a data-free setting. This is work of my PhD student, who just graduated um, at the beginning of the year and is now working as a postdoc with Anshu Dubey, who should be here as well. I hope to see you later, Anshu. And uh, he's a very talented researcher who is trained in my group to work with transparency and reproducibility as a priority. So if you find this on archive, you will also find links to all the code and the associated data for this work in case you want to check our results. And this figure shows um, the U velocity around a 2D circular cylinder at Reynolds 200, um, which is post uh, the instability that generates vortex shedding, obtained with a traditional CFD solver in the um, left column there uh, with using a immersed boundary method. And um, then an unsteady physics informed neural network method that was implemented using the NVIDIA modulus toolkit. And on the far right, a data-driven pin method where you are using the DNS data to feed us boundary conditions. Um, um, uh, while you are feeding that data, you do see vortex shedding, but as soon as you turn off the data with the, vo with the vortex shedding signal to the flow, the solution reverts to a steady state. So in the data-free version, the middle column there, the flow simply remains steady and never exhibits vortex shedding. Uh, we used in this work spectral analysis. We had dynamic mode decomposition to analyze uh, the results, and uh, we concluded that the pin method is indeed both diffusive and dispersive from the point of view of numerical methods, which could be related to this limitation, this inability to capture this phenomenon, but we're not sure if this completely explains it, and it's an open question. Which leads me to another anti-pattern which is to only publish positive results, known in other fields as publication bias, or the file drawer pro problem. Uh, it means that whenever you get negative results that are not, you know, they're not publishable, who's going to publish the fact that you failed, unfortunately? So those results end up in your uh, file cabinet. And what happens is that we're not learning from each other from those failures. And so I call on us to find ways to also publish not the neat final result that tells the perfect story, but all the intermediate failures as well. Because as we posted a conference paper with our preliminary results uh, that failed to capture vortex shedding with a physics and neural network, my student received an email from a postdoc in Germany who shared that he had had the same frustrating experience and he had spent three years trying to figure out where the bug in his code was and never discovered it because it's not a bug. The method wasn't actually able to uh, solve this problem. So the work never saw the light of day because there's no venue to publish failures. And publication bias in the research literature has been most discussed in empirical fields uh, using the null hypothesis, hypothesis statistical testing, where, uh, for example, experimental psychology, where if something is below the, uh, you know, uh, if something is below the p-value that demonstrates that uh, statistical significance, it gets published. All of the other results that do not have statistical significance don't see the light of day. So this manifests in only positive results ending up in the scholarly literature. Overall, we should worry about the rampant lack of transparency and irreproducibility of results, which is a big concern as well. It was a big concern for the Santa Fe participants. So let's start with a ubiquitous classic statement that you find in the scientific literature all over, which is data available upon reasonable request. 
The problem is, first, that authors who did not, this is the, something that what we don't talk about. Uh, of course, it's hard to respond to a request, and what is reasonable is, of course, uh, unclear. But the problem is that authors who did not prepare for sharing data all through the workflow before publication will find themselves really unable to locate the data after the fact, um, or they will lack a contemporaneous record of the research process that uh, it makes them unable to retrace the steps. So leaving the data or code sharing or preparation for a later time of quote-unquote request is just too late. And many journals who have transitioned from policies of making data available upon request to additional requirements, like requiring a data availability statement in their paper, or mandating deposit of data, and even peer review of data and code, um, have found this to be quite a struggle. And a factor in this trend is the growth. So, so there is you know, a tendency, at least, to require to be a little bit more stringent in those requirements. And a factor is, uh, indeed, the growing availability of infrastructure for data sharing that makes this a little easier. You don't have to ship a magnetic tape on, uh, on FedEx anymore, of course. Um, another factor is the recognition that authors frequently just ignore such requests. In this um, uh, empirical study, we see that even when journals have explicit data sharing policies, authors just ignore the requests. They, uh, in this work, looked at a random sample of uh, more than 200 scientific papers that were published in the journal Science. After Science had implemented a policy uh, in 2011 uh, for sharing of data, and they found that they were able to obtain the artifacts from the authors in only 44% of the sample. And then from those, were able to reproduce the findings in only 26% 26, 26 of the cases. This other study tested the ability to recover data collected um, after you have funder-imposed requirements on public availability. And they found that the majority of data were not recovered in this case, 26% recovery rate of the data out of more than 300 projects. And uh, similar to you know, journal-driven efforts, it just is not working. And in this case, in half of the failures, the reason the authors gave was loss of contact with the original data creator. Of course, your graduate student left, your postdocs left, and if you did not uh, uh, have a policy of data management at the time, then it's going to be too late. Um, so the authors conclude here that the funding agencies really need to dedicate resources to enforce compliance uh, and provide both data sharing infrastructure and technical support to make this easier for authors. Because the fact is that despite this kind of drift into more data sharing policies, once the researchers receive the funding or publish their papers, you have hardly any ability to enforce the requirements, and the authors have little or no incentives to comply. And so it, now it's becoming more and more common to see papers in the machine learning literature, but in particular, it's become uh, um, uh, habitual to see papers with code. Even Archive has this um, tab now, papers with code. Somewhere in the paper, the authors will list a GitHub repository that hosts the code that was developed uh, in the course of the research. That's great. But it's not enough, unfortunately, because findable, if you uh, are familiar with it, FAIR policies, findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable. Findable doesn't mean a software repository on GitHub. Findable means an archival quality deposit with a DOI. So you must make an archive in Zenodo or a similar service, a service that guarantees a persistence of that material. Because anybody, any owner is able to delete a GitHub repository at any time. You just have to confirm and click the red button. Um, but there's no guarantee of persistence, of course, on GitHub. That is not what it's used for. Accessible means retrievable by the identifier, the DOI or similar identifier, using open protocols. It should be machine accessible. Interoperable means that it has a well-structured metadata that is machine actionable. Reusable implies a proper license. None of these things is achieved by supplementary materials, by the way, which is where data goes to die. 
Poor understanding of transparency and reproducibility is unfortunately quite common. Here is uh, a little rant, a more recent rant on Twitter, uh, in which I commented on the Siam Journal of Scientific Computing, uh, which uh, offers now a reproducibility badge when uh, uh, marking an article that has code and data available. But what they consider available is not up to reproducibility standards. This was from February this year. Now they have removed the reference to GitHub and similar service, but still they don't require a persistent identifier, a DOI. And they don't offer uh, advice to authors on, on how to achieve persistence, and they still accept data in the supplementary materials as alternative, which is not a good idea. So, the point is that open source code, properly archived uh, code and data, uh, is better than just providing a GitHub repository, but it's still not enough um, to achieve full transparency of the research workflow. Because improving computational reproducibility involves uh, capturing and sharing from a lot of other information about the computational environment, about the steps required to collect, process, and analyze the data. And Scientific rigor extends to data sets via the concept of provenance and stewardship of that data. And this is most important in the uh, settings right now of AI, of course. Tracing and documenting the sources of data, the data transformation and the versions that were used in each case of this, in each uh, stage of the study. And a core principle here is that data should be, the, the raw data that you use should be preser preserved and touched, and the transformed data should be tracked through the metadata. And recently, the concept of version control that we know from software has been extended to data files, but of course, those data files are very big, so you don't apply version control on the data. You don't put the data files on GitHub, uh, but you uh, uh, those large files can be stored in other systems, uh, often in binary format, but the virtual version control is applied on the metadata. And um, there are several new uh, technologies that we can take advantage for automatically collecting data provenance records and all the data processing steps into a reproducible pipeline. Uh, often, we can even go so far as connecting cloud services where the large data files are stored. Now, uh, acknowledging that scientific workflows do represent a complex flow of data products through various steps of collection, transformation, and analysis, then uh, we have to make it easier for authors to uh, automate this process, so, uh, store workflow provenance automatically. And this is still not available you know, uh, for, e for easy adoption. Another anti-padding that we should also acknowledge, that is, again, not particular to scientific machine learning, but is a sorry affair there for, um, uh, recently, is what we call gatekeeping. So here's a hypothetical scenario. You are new to this, but you have a very talented PhD student who's been working and is on fire. Months of painstaking work. The results are disappointing. So why does this not work? Let's write it up anyway. So you prepare to, to, to present at a conference. You post the preprint on archive. 24 hours later, you get an angry email from a big shot about your erroneous paper. And it is copied to 15 people, including your department chair? What kind of behavior is that? Do we accept that um, famous researchers with a lot of clout should be bullying uh, mid-career researchers because they don't agree with the results? Or can we do better than that? Do we reward those behaviors? Or do we make them unacceptable? We have some decisions to make when fields are uh, hot. On the event of the 10th anniversary celebration of the Center of Open Science, which happened recently, the founder and director posted a thread on Twitter about uh, the story of trying to reform the research culture towards openness, integrity, and reproducibility. The Center of Open Science has been operating for 10 years as a response to the reproducibility crisis in experimental psychology. He said that in every field that has looked, reproducibility, robustness, and replicability are much weaker than expected or desired. And why the known solutions to these challenges have not been adopted is simply the intransigence of the reward system. 
It's a culture, socio-technical problem that we need to address. So other anti-patterns that uh, we could comment on um, uh, are several. I prepared this talk for today, uh, reviewing a few, but uh, I understand in the limited time that I have that I could not address them all. So others are overgeneralization, data negligence, and puffery, I call it, puffery. Um, um, so I want to leave time for discussion, so I'm not going to spend time on these today. But let me just comment on puffery a little bit, which means exaggerated, usually self-praise. So if you are reading a methods paper and you find a gratuitous citation report in the paper, like such and such references has been cited 5,000 times, or citations have doubled in the last year, or whatever like that, ask yourself if that kind of thing really belongs in a scientific paper unless it's information science, but how is such a statement any sort of evidence to support the paper's findings or the claims? And that's what I call puffery. And this slide I stole from um, um, the director of the Center of Open Science addressing the issues of our reward system. This is what we need to work on so that we could start addressing the anti-patterns of uh, every new uh, hot approach. So I want to, I realize I'm running out of time. Um, I'm afraid that I, 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 I would not spend as much time as I had planned on this part of the talk. Um, but I wanted to mention that there is a call for open science. Uh, 2023 has been called the year of open science in the US with the participation of several uh, federal agencies and many other organizations. And I just want to highlight uh, about the definition of open science and how it has evolved. Um, this definition that goes back to 2018 from the National Academy says that open science aims to ensure the free availability and usability of scholarly publications, the data that result from scholarly research methodologies, including code. Now, I want to point this, I want to highlight to you that this definition, which we oft often see variations of, focuses narrowly on the products of research, the stuff, what we do with stuff, not the people. Now, in many ways, Europe has been ahead um, in open science. This is from 2016. And this definition of open science in the vision document, um, open innovation, open science, open to the world, defines open science as a new approach to the scientific process based on cooperative work. So it talks about sharing and using all the available not knowledge. Uh, but the perspective here has shifted from products of research to the process, which is an interesting observation. Um, but I want to highlight this observation from Canadian philosopher and co-creator of the first MOOC before edX and all of those, Stephen Downs. And he said this in, the, in a video about open education, in fact. Openness is about the possibilities of communicating with other people. It's not about stuff. What we do with stuff is about what we do with each other. So it's, he's hinting at the social, key social interactions that make learning, discovery, and sense-making meaningful to us. And here's a better definition that is at a higher level, not focused on stuff. I like this very much. Open science is transparent and accessible knowledge that is shared and developed through collaborative networks, uh, addressing the socio-technical nature of research. And um, as more conversations have been held about open science, we'd find that uh, we move beyond the availability of data, methods, and code to the aspect, to the perspective of the complicated issues of reward system and incentives. Uh, we need values that align to the incentive structure of the scholarly community that are reflected in hiring, tenure, and promotion, in the awards that we give, in the things that we celebrate as a community. And, um, of course, the challenges are huge. Of course, how can we cope with the issue that universities don't want to change their promotion and tenure criteria? But we can start in these types of settings to have those discussions. This is the UNESCO definition. I'm aware of the uh, end of the time, so I'm not going to dwell on that and just mention the uh, Transform to Open Science TOPS mission of NASA, which is a 130 million investment through federal year 2007, and an initiative that um, aims to disseminate the idea of open science throughout, the, throughout at least the United States. And it highlights, this definition highlights this balancing act between openness and the need to protect sensitive information, of course, and privacy, hints at a proactive approach to creating collaborative opportunities, and emphasizes that for science to be truly open, it must enable and support reproducibility. 
And I note the explicit mention of equity in this definition, which implies not only the importance of equal access to scientific knowledge, but also equal opportunities for participation. And uh, so there should be no place for gatekeeping in open science, no tolerance for sloppy reporting, and no rewards for irreproducible results. Um, similar to the role of open source software, I discuss in this perspective uh, uh, the idea that research is impactful when the network of results and how they are shared have a meaningful role in society and the continuing accumulation of knowledge. Um, and given I've taken more of the time that I planned, I'm going to end it there. Thank you ever so much. Thank you very much, Lorena. Uh, we have time for questions. Uh, there are microphones in the room. If you'd like to step up, I'll, also for those online, if you uh, want to type, uh, have access, uh, please do so. Uh, I think, Anshu, you were first and then. So, uh, hi. <laughs> um, it's more of an observation than a question. And this is upon all of us as reviewers also. Uh, I want to tell you about a colleague who actually got a very significant negative result that he thought was among the most useful bits of research that he had done. It has been rejected from six places. So it's also upon us as reviewers to make sure that we value negative results. And I have a similar experience where we found a performance anomaly that was very significant. It was eventually um, uh, traced to the memory pinning that the compilers do, and we really had a hard time getting any place to accept that for publication. So, and that's. think about it. We know about the scientific method, right? Negative results are the only ones that are uh, actually uh, forever. <laughs> no. Positive results can always be negated, right? But negative results are. Our so it's a question of what we want to prioritize as a scientific communication because things that are pitfalls for people ought to be as much a part of scientific communication as innovations and novelty is. And that's how we can learn from each other. Many times a lot of uh, young um, students uh, waste a lot of time because they don't have that availability of learning from the mistakes we've all have made. Thank you, Anshu. Yeah, um, uh, state your name, please, when you... Hello, yeah. I'm Peter Duben, and I really enjoyed your talk. I think uh, it was really, really a, a great reminder of how we should do science in principle and, and kind of all the different things that we should really avoid. Um, I think I agree with almost all of the individual steps, but I think in total I'm kind of a bit, I think you were a bit unfair towards machine learning and deep learning in this kind of area of research in principle. And I'm saying this as a, as a domain scientist, so I'm coming from the weather and climate modeling domain, and I've really been furious about a lot of titles and abstracts I've seen in the last couple of years. But on the other hand, I'm really, really grateful, actually, that machiners are coming into the domain and basically trying to kind of ex explore the methods and kind of what they, they find is really spectacular and really interesting for us. So I'm kind of a, a bit more fine with them kind of doing some mistakes because I think it's probably almost impossible to come from the outside of the domain and actually make like always a fair comparison to the right benchmarks and kind of to the, 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 the right diagnostics. And I have to say, I'm also kind of really happy about the way at the moment how we're interacting with the machine learning community in a sense that we're actually kind of coming together and building like diagnostics and kind of really talking about the results and how to kind of really proof check them. So it's kind of, I, I, and the only statement that I want to make is basically, I think like uh, machine learning as such is, has, has kind of had a bumpy time in the last couple of, of years in this, uh, this perspective, but I'm pretty sure like if you give it like another two or three years within our domain, then I would say there, there's probably not more frauds in the machine learning part than at any other kind of field within the domain. So it's kind of like, I think we're getting there to kind of be a bit more even out there. Indeed, um, the computational science community had similar moments of self-reflection uh, 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 maybe a few decades ago, right, Mike? We did, we did go through this already. Yeah. Yeah. But machine learning is, is the talk of the town. Yeah. And so my, my intention is to make us think about it uh, and like um, Zena the warrior princess said to her sidekick once, don't be sorry, just improve. Yeah. <laughs> I, think, I think we can take one more, Dan, go for it. Okay. Please introduce Thank yourself. Uh, Dan Katz from University of Illinois. Just a quick comment on the um, uh, negative result. 
Um, so I've, I've co-ran a workshop to highlight negative results for, I don't know, three times now. We have one coming up at eScience in Cyprus uh, in October. Um, and the two times that I've done this before, we've had a very hard time actually getting papers. Um, so, so even when we give an opportunity, I'm just, I guess I'm kind of reinforcing your message. When we give an opportunity, people are still very unwilling to talk about their negative results. It's true. So. It's because we, you know how students in the classroom are afraid to ask questions because they might, uh, they, they feel they might look stupid. We, we suffer of, from that all the time. So we need to find ways of rewarding people um, for sharing their negative results so that it, there's, there's an incentive because it is hard, you know, it's, 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 it's humbling. Um, we need to make it uh, a rewarding experience somehow. Right, and, and I guess the only thing I would add to that is a conference publication doesn't seem to be a sufficient reward. Thank you all for listening, and um, I hope I've uh, started a conversation. Uh, this is the f I've written this talk only, you know, for for today, and therefore I think I can do better and continue collecting some of the anti patterns. So if you have a favorite one that uh, you want to share with me uh, to include in my menu, I can probably uh, uh, add to this, and the next time this could be um, a more comprehensive list. Thank you so much. That's thank you.